Good morning, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Community Bible Church. We're so glad you're here. Will you stand with us as we prepare to worship this morning? Lord God, we thank you that you are here among us right now, Lord. You are all around us, Lord. Would you help us to have eyes to see you, Lord? Would you help us to have hearts that would lay down everything else, Lord, and worship you this morning, Lord, with joy? God, we know that joy is not something that has to do with our circumstance. It has to do with the passion that you have given us and the love and unconditional love that you have given us. So, Lord, we lift our voices to you this morning. We lift our hands to you. We worship you with all that we are. In your name we pray. Amen. We worship the God who is. 
excited to speak about our guest speaker. I um, had the privilege of reading his book many uh, years ago, actually, and uh, his most recent book a couple, uh, year or so ago, whenever it came out. And um, I was so inspired when I read this book about how blind we are to the world around us, how, um, how we can be so caught in our phones that we miss so many moments that God has for us. And when I read that book, I, I was continually like finding myself in these amazing God moments where I was like, wow, when we actually open ourselves up to realizing what God is doing around us, the way that he allows us to work in his, um, in the ways of the things that he's doing, it blows my mind. And of course, it's been a couple of years, so I, I kind of, you know, you, you get passionate about something and then it, you kind of, time goes by and you forget. But as he was coming, I was remembering all those things. And so even this week, I was, I was starting to like, be like, God, okay, use me, help me to see, help me to see those around me. And there was like at least three circumstances this, this week alone where God was like, hey, reach out to this person or, or do this thing. And, and I was like kind of blown away by how God was faithful 
And two of them were really easy things, and one of them was like a really hard thing. And I was like, God, I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And God just kind of reminded me about the fear that we experience as actually being that spiritual warfare that holds us back from engaging in what God does. And when I did this one thing that I really didn't want to do, it ended up being the most fruitful and amazing thing that I've done. And I was like just so in awe of God. And I think that's the beautiful thing is that when we engage with what God is doing, yes, it moves toward the kingdom, but it also moves our hearts closer to God. And I was kind of um, remembering this verse that keeps playing in my mind. It's actually in the message translation, so it kind of uh, reads differently. Um, it's in Psalm 40, verses 4 through 5. It says, Blessed are you who give yourselves over to God. Turn your backs on the world's sure thing. Ignore what the world worships. And this is the part that keeps playing in my mind. The world is a huge stockpile of God wonders and God thoughts. What if we approached every day of our lives thinking, God, this world is full. It's a huge stockpile of God wonders and God thoughts. How much more we would see him in our lives, how much deeper we would go with him. So I encourage you in that this morning that we would pray that God would open up our eyes to see the huge stockpile of God wonders and God thoughts all around us. Amen. Amen. Amen.
it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I can feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I can feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. You are way maker, miracle. God, this morning we acknowledge that you are working all the time, Lord. There's not a moment in this world that you just step back and kind of just watch, Lord. You are working and moving all around us. For each one of us, every day, everywhere we go, you are moving and working. And yet sometimes, Lord, so often we just miss it. So God, would you give us eyes to see, Lord. Eyes to see where to engage your world around us. Because we want to know you as the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper, the light and the darkness, not just in our heads, but deep, deep within our hearts. So come and move and change us this morning, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. that do not have uh, the means to pay either part or even all of their, uh, their way. So if any of you want to help toward that, you can write a check today to Community Bible Church and in the memo just put men's retreat and that money will go toward that. Uh, we have, excuse me, I, I don't even know, three, 320, thank you. That's what I was gonna say, but it didn't seem right. 320, and that's transportation, everything, meals, lodging, so. Yeah, appreciate that. We have the amazing opportunity today to have Ryan Montague. Doc he uh, first came on my radar like probably about a year ago when Jess Fonseller gave me a book, uh, one of Ryan's first books or possibly his first book, uh, Divine Opportunity, that we have mentioned a ton in sermons and what Brittany's been talking about, just being aware of everyday moments in our life uh, of what God's doing and how we can be a part of that. And uh, he's got another book out now, too, that he's going to talk about this morning. And I asked him to bring his books this morning so that you can get a copy. And they'll be available tonight when he comes back at 6. Tonight's going to be a whole other thing, diving in deeper and question and answer time and just a great interactive time. If you're doing sermon-based small groups, I didn't make a study guide this week because both books at the end of each chapter have amazing questions that you can use in your small group. 
much better than anything I could write. So uh, use those, get a copy of those. If you can't afford one, we as a church can help you with that. But let's welcome uh, Dr. Ryan up to speak to us today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, it's awesome to, to be here with you all, and uh, just a real pleasure to also kind of finally be out here to uh, and share some time with Jeff and Denise Sponseller, who we've, we've known for the last nine years, and, and they, hear, they hold a really dear place uh, for my wife and I, and, and for our kids too, and so they've heard us talk about the Sponsellers as they have been, uh, re- we've been renting from them for, nine, for the last nine years. And really, without them, we, we couldn't afford to live in California. And so the only reason we're still even here is because of them. Otherwise, we would have probably moved back like five, six years ago now at this point. So, uh, and God has done crazy, crazy things since us being here and having been able to stay here. This has just been life-changing. So, so we're so grateful to actually be able to come out here and spend some time with them as well. Uh, and be able to get into this, this topic, which is near and dear to me, of this idea of divine appointments and divine opportunities, and, and really being able to step out and, and share with people and connect with people. And this has been a, a big journey. So uh, for me personally, and I'll share a little bit about that as we go, uh, but the topic that we're really kind of getting into today is, is this idea of everyday evangelism. And, and I'm going to break that down uh, throughout the morning and again kind of go even into some deeper elements tonight of really what that means. Because a, a lot of us have kind of grown up hearing the word evangelism and it, for, at least for me, it seemed very out of reach. And that's something that pastors and missionaries do and, and gifted, anointed people. And then, the, the, and then I just kind of chill. And that's why even getting into the Great Commission of having read that, and I'll read it here in a minute, is, was that idea of like, that's why we tithe, like so that other people can evangelize, right? Send them out uh, and let that tithe take care of my portion of it. So I just want to say a quick word of prayer, and then we're going to move into some things here this morning. I think it's going to be a, a great time with you all. But dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you and I praise you for Community Bible Church, for their position here in Ventura, For the work that they do in the community, I thank you for all those that are here, that have made their way here, your sons and daughters, that are hungry and thirsty to experience you, to hear from you, to be co-workers with you. And so, Lord, I just pray that you direct my thoughts and my words, that you direct our time together in a way that encourages and edifies and builds up the body of Christ so that we feel empowered, encouraged, and, and, and sent out to be able to reach the lost, to be able to love the broken, to be able to care like Christ, to be able to connect in people's lives that are, that are desperate and hurting, that they themselves need somebody with a holy boldness to step out and to comfort them, to pray for them, to bring Christ to them. Lord, that our lives would be a living letter, a living epistle, a living letter of Christ, that the way that we live is an extension of your word, and it continues in our lives. So Lord, give us wisdom, give us guidance to be able to speak to us this morning. We love you and we praise you, and it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, this morning, getting into this topic of everyday evangelism, and and the kind of subtitle of this is to taste and see, to taste and see. And so I want to start with this word evangelizing and what it means to me now at this point, Uh, because originally when I thought of evangelism, I always thought of, you know, Matthew 28, verses 18 through, through 20, where Jesus says that he came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations and all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so part of this is this idea of the the Great Commission, of actually being able to, to be sent out to go and to make disciples, to encourage, to build people up, to actually share Christ with people. And I think I always like read super quick over this promise that Jesus gives us, that he is always with us and will be with us to the end of the age. And, and that was kind of the, this verse, again, of thinking about more of the missionaries and the pastors and the others that would be sent out. 
until really thinking about this idea of evangelizing, which is really just simply advocating for something that you're excited and passionate about. So evangelizing is to just advocating for something that you're excited and passionate about. That's what it is. And then I realized we evangelize all the time for other things besides Christ. Like for a while, uh, when I first moved to California, somebody took me to a BJ's restaurant and introduced me to the Pazuki. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I was evangelizing about Pazuki's to just like random people. And it was just like a whole new world had been opened. And, and I was like getting heretical. I was like, I am a new creation in a Pazuki. Like, I don't know what's going on here. This is amazing. And, but we, we do this. We evangelize for Netflix series, for movies, for songs, for YouTube influencers. But we have, have, you heard, have you read this book? Oh my gosh, you got to read this book. Have you watched this video? Oh, you got to watch this video. We, and we share viral videos all the time. And that's all we're doing is we're evangelizing. We're advocating, you got to watch this. You got to see this. You got to read this. You got to hear that. Because we're excited and passionate about it. And so we do this all the time. We just don't do it for Jesus. Because we've believed the lies of the enemy that it's going to be awkward or it's going to be, it's not politically correct or it's going to step on somebody's toes. And so we, we hold ourselves back. And so really this uh, Matthew 28, this great commission, I think in a lot of ways, for a lot of people, myself included, it creates a conviction because you know that you should be sharing Jesus with people, but you also kind of feel stuck and you don't really know where to start, and maybe you haven't even seen a model for what that can look like in 2021 or anytime relatively soon, and so you've got this, this great commission that's been placed on our lives. We do have a love relationship with Jesus, and, and a lot of us have the desire to want to share him with others, but we don't know where to start because, again, we lack models. We lack what this might look like in today's day and age. And so this is where the divine opportunities come in. And I've learned a lot from my father-in-law uh, in this because he's had amazing, incredible divine appointments throughout his, his, his life and his career as a pastor and Bible professor. And, and he helped to kind of paraphrase the Great Commission and you can jot this down in your notes, which is, he just simply paraphrased it as, go and give opportunity for people to experience God. So the Great Commission, he just kind of paraphrased it, is go and give opportunity for people to experience God. And this idea that then came to me of, of really what it is, is that it's just being mindful of the people that are, that are around you. And today I'm going to share plenty of stories that I've had uh, where I've given people an opportunity to experience God at In-N-Out and Chick-fil-A and McDonald's and Starbucks and Jack in the Box. And, and, I, and I joke that I have, I have a thriving fast food ministry. Uh, <clears throat> but really, that's just where, where I was at and where I was spending time. But when you're there, you're not just getting a cup of coffee and sitting down and having your me time. Is that there's other people around that, that need a word, that need an encouragement, that need a prayer. And in all these places. And what it is, is just letting them taste and see that the Lord is good. And so what I want to read next is from, you know, is that scripture from Psalm 34, 1 through 8. That says, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord, and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed, and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. Verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. So it's simply taste and see that the Lord is good. That's what we have the opportunity to be able to do for others, is to allow them to taste and see that the Lord is good. 
whether that's just moving with compassion, with grace, with forgiveness, with gentleness, with prayer, whatever that might be, but we're allowing them to taste and see that the Lord is good. We're giving them an opportunity to experience God. We're shifting the conversation from a good conversation to a God conversation. And then that allows them, and, and a lot of the ways that I do that is just simply by, by praying for somebody. So if I'm talking to somebody, and again, they've just been talking about their lives, but I'm hearing a pain point or a stress point or something that's going on, at the end of it, it's just sim- simply saying, hey, before we, you know, before we head, head our separate ways, like, can I just pray for you about that? And what that does is it, shape, it, it switches it from a good conversation with a good guy to now they know they're having a godly conversation with a godly guy. And so it's that subtle shift, because before all of this, which my background is, is not this kind of stuff at all. I grew up, uh, you know, lukewarm Catholic, and, and really didn't really discover a relationship with, with Christ, a personal relationship with Christ, until I was 23, and I moved to, to, to Hollywood from, I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri. And then a friend introduced me to a true church there, and it began kind of this, this new adventure. And then began, through my father-in-law, hearing about divine appointments, and then realizing, like, wow, these are, like, crazy stories that I'm actually hearing from him and, and knowing that these are truthful things. And then I had the opportunity to study them and write about them. And then, uh, really, we, even when the first book, the Divine Opportunity book, came out, I still really didn't have, like, any, you know, noteworthy kind of divine appointments for myself. And then I just trusted the process. And I just kept stepping out and stepping out and stepping out and then started to have experience after experience after experience and to where now I have dozens and dozens and dozens of stories and experiences and encounters of just trusting the process and being willing to have the courage to take the risk because divine opportunities always (laughs) happen after a little bit of a risk taking. And I talk about it as having 20 seconds of courage. All you really need is 20 seconds of courage. And that's the moment where you shift it from a good conversation with a good person to a godly conversation with a godly person. And now they know a shift has happened in that and taken place. And this taste and see that the, that the Lord is good and this excitement to share is that I just kind of thought about this recently uh, where I went on a missions trip. It was just kind of a, a one-day trip down to Tijuana with some friends. Uh, I'm on the board for this nonprofit called Reach Up, Reach Out, and we were partnering with, with a, a ministry down in Tijuana so we kind of served all day at this, uh, this dump site where people were, were living and this orphanage. And then we went back to uh, the mothers uh, of the uh, missionaries of their, uh, to their house, and, and we had dinner. And she made these tacos that were ridiculous. Uh, so good. Best tacos I've, I've ever had in my life. I don't know what was going on there. And then I, I got talked into to, to trying the horchata. Uh, which it was, I mean, there's like next level, like levels of sugar in this thing. It was literally like, <laughs> like drinking liquid Cinnabon icing is the best way to describe it. And then uh, they, they had this dessert. And by this point, I had had like six tacos. I just had the, the liquid icing and, and really wasn't looking for like more dessert. And, and then other people started getting the dessert. And they would come back and they would take a bite and then they would just be like, oh my gosh, you got to try this. Uh, and so like every person that came back to the table was just like raving about this dessert. And, and honestly, it didn't even look like much. It's not like a dessert where you look at it and you're like, for sure, like I'm willing to, I'm willing to do that, uh, regardless of how I feel afterwards. <laughs> Whereas like some desserts, you're like, ah, just like the looks at it, you're like, ah, I'll pass on that. Yeah, where, so it was like, it was, didn't look like much, but the way everybody was raving about it, and I was just like, all right, I'm doing it. And so I grabbed a slice, tried it, and sure enough, it was just incredible. And it was this idea of, again, people advocating for things, where it allows you to taste and see just how good it is. And then the other thing that came out of that was, was we were talking with the, the, the woman that made it, and she refuses to give out any recipes. So she, re, she just refuses to give away any recipes. And, and that really stood out to me because I think that that's exactly how so many of us are with the church and with Christ. We've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, but we refuse to give out the recipe. We've experienced the peace. We've experienced the love. We've experienced the compassion of Christ, but for whatever reason, we're withholding the recipe from others. 
and keeping them from being able to taste and see for themselves what we have experienced. And in fact, uh, Kathy Lee Gifford, who's a TV host and personality, she was interviewed and asked one time, uh, because she ends up you know, kind of pivoting and talking about God and about Christ quite a bit. And so the interviewer asked her, why do you always feel the need to talk about Christ so much? And she said, well, if I had the cure for cancer, how cruel would it be for me to withhold that from people that are dying? She said, well, I truly believe in my heart that I have the cure for the cancer of the soul. So why wouldn't I want to share that with as many people as I possibly can? And so it's, it's giving, it's giving away the recipe, it's giving away the cure. It's actually this giving process that comes into this. And again, this can look a lot of different ways. And I'll give you an example of a time where I was at, at Target. And uh, this was, I think, the previous Christmas because I was there buying some, uh, buying some Christmas decorations and lights for the house and stuff. And so I'm back in this Christmas section. And, and while I'm back there kind of looking around, this homeless lady uh, kind of pushing all her stuff kind of comes back in, into the aisle. And, and so we kind of started talking and, uh, a little bit and, and just kind of got into some random you know, random facts about her family, and she's had a lot of heartbreak with her sister and all this kind of stuff. And for whatever reason, I, I, didn't, I didn't change it to a, to a God conversation. I didn't pray for her, and, and, and we had kind of like parted ways, and I walked off to get some other stuff. And as I walked off, I just knew right away, like, this is a missed opportunity. So I prayed, okay, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back. I'm going to go back to the Christmas section, and if she's still there, then, then I'm going to pray for her. So I go back to the Christmas section, and sure enough, she's still there. And so I go up to her and just said, hey, you know, uh, I, you know, as I walked away, I just felt like I should have prayed for you. You know, would it be okay if I prayed for you? And she said, absolutely. And so, so I put my hand on her, prayed for, prayed over, and, and then we, we parted ways. And I was like, okay, now I'm feeling, feeling good now, heading out. So I, so I move out. And then I feel convicted because she had uh, really some, she just beat up old jankety shoes. And so as I walked away, I felt convicted that I should have bought her some shoes. And so I'm okay. So then I pray, okay, God, uh, I'm going to finish getting what I need to get. And when I'm ready to go, I'll, I'll walk by the women's shoe section. And if I see her on the way as I go to check out, then I'll buy her some shoes. And so I walk by the women. I'm just hitting the women's shoes. And then I'm going to hit the, the register and get out, get out of there. And sure enough, Right when I get to the corner of, of one aisle and the other, right by the women's shoes, there she is. So I connect with her again. And at this point, she's like, bro, couldn't we just like handle this in like one conversation? <laughs> this could have been one event. If you just had obedience and a little bit of boldness, we could have handled this in one conversation. So this is like broken up three or four things, just keep coming back. Um, so then I'm like, I just felt like God wanted me to buy you some shoes. Like, can I buy you some shoes? She said, sure. So, you know, it was, it was really a, a really special moment of just, you know, she's checking out the shoes, and, you know, it's kind of like when I take my daughters, and, and uh, my middle daughter, who's uh, seven, almost eight, she's big into shoes, uh, and it's like, it's an experience, and that's kind of how it felt with this woman. It was just like, this was an experience where she's picking out shoes, and, and you know, is it okay if I get these? I'm like, sure, get whatever you want, like, absolutely, and just kind of gave her free reign, and it was just this fun, super amazing moment, and then went with her up to the, to the checkout, paid for all the stuff, and then kind of blessed her and said goodbye. But that was an opportunity to give someone an, an opportunity to experience God, to taste and see that the Lord is good, and to give away some of the recipe for what this is actually meant to be and look like for people. And so the, the second point here, the first one is let them taste and see that the Lord is good. The second one, it comes from a quote from this philosopher, Martin Buber. And he, is a, he was a philosopher in the, the late 1800s, early 1900s, and he wrote a lot on genuine dialogue and moments of meaning, and he also himself had a spiritual bent to it, that we could actually experience God in and, and through one another. And he said this quote, he said, there are, there are no gifted or ungifted here, only those who give themselves and those who withhold themselves. And that was huge for me because it really, again, my introduction to all of this was through my father-in-law who was this pastor and a practical theology professor, clearly anointed with the Holy Spirit, charismatic kind of outgoing guy. And so it was easy to hear his stories and be like, man, that's incredible. Like I can see it for you. But 
not for me. And so I really viewed it as gifted. This person has a gift. This person is gifted. And, and my giftings are elsewhere. And hopefully we'll find them someday. If you're ever that person, you're like, yeah, I'm pretty good at a lot of things, not great at anything. Uh, but it was this idea of like, when, if you have it in your mind as there's gifted and ungifted, then you're, you're already losing out and missing out. But if you just have it as really the only difference between these, these two individuals, it's not gifted and ungifted, it's just simply those who give themselves and those who withhold themselves. And this has been true time and time and time and time again for me, was that am I going to withhold myself or am I going to give myself? Can I die to my, to my own self right now and reach out to this person? Can I die to the fact that I think this might be socially awkward? Or can I die to the fact that I fear some social rejection? Can I die to these feelings and walk by faith? And that's the difference, is that the, the reality is that I found is that God can do more with an ungifted, obedient person than he can with a gifted, disobedient person. Because you can have all the gifting in the world, but if you're disobedient, then all for naught. And you can have very little gifting, but if you're just obedient like crazy, then you're going to see God move. And you're going to see these experiences happen. Because the, the fact of the matter is, if you've ever heard, has anybody heard of the Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman? And so a lot of heads nodding. Gary Chapman wrote this book, The Five Love Languages, which are helpful for people to recognize how one another experience love, whether it's quality time or acts of service or gift giving or words of affirmation or physical touch. And, and I realized, as I was reading through the scripture, Jesus gives away his love language. Jesus says, those that love me obey my commands. Jesus' love language is obedience. So if we speak Jesus' love language of obedience, it's not about giftedness, it's about obedience. It's not about giftedness, it's about giving. And so this is where it opens things wide up for every single person in this room. Because even as, you know, for myself, again, overcoming a lot of things. Never seeing this kind of stuff modeled as a kid. You know, being really kind of shy, and even though it doesn't look like that now. But uh, even when I, I, my wife and I went back to Kansas City and we had dinner with one of my childhood friends that I had known since I was two. And he was describing me as a, as a, as a young kid. And so my friend Trey was describing me to my wife, and he literally described me as, as painfully shy. He was like, oh, yeah, Ryan, he's, he's just painfully shy. So it's overcoming all of that. So again, now that I've had the experiences that I've had, I, I feel like now people look to me the way I look to my father-in-law. And so now I can actually, you know, remind people and tell people it's not about a giftedness. Is that I've overcome kind of like the shy, you know, awkwardness of things to be able to step into this stuff. Uh, in fact, just an experience I had in the spring was that kind of a, uh, some friends, uh, their, her dad was, was in hospice care, and her dad had uh, kind of drank a lot and, you know, abused his body, and his body was shutting down, and he had just kind of aged out of being able to have, uh, uh, I think, kidney transplant or liver transplant, and so they just had to put him in hospice care, and so at this point, he, he wasn't a believer. In fact, his wife was like a passionate, you know, everyday kind of church goer, uh, uh, Catholic and, and Christian. And, and, her, and then her, her daughter, our friend, again, strong believer, engaged in the church, lots of influence around him, but he just didn't believe and for his whole life. And so finally, when he gets into this hospice care, at one point he finally asked to, to talk to a... Um, to a chaplain. And so they, they reach out, nobody's available. And so then she reached out to me and said, because actually, and this is a crazy divine appointment, is that as he was moving out, they were actually giving away this, they had this like 46, he was like, no, it's 65 inch uh, television. And it was kind of a bigger rear projector thing. And so they were trying to get rid of this 65 inch television. So uh, she, she gave it to us and we set it up. We kind of cleared out our garage. We put it in our garage for this like little movie theater experience for our kids. And so we, we took on the, the TV. Then after we took the TV, two weeks later is when she reached out and said, hey, my dad says that he's open to talking to a chaplain. 
and to someone, you know, but nobody's available. Would you be free to actually go out and just kind of talk with him? And I was like, sure. You know, I'm like pumped up. I'm like ready to go. I'm like, yeah, let's do this. So, so I, I jump in the car. I finish up my classes that night, and I drive out there. And again, I'm like I'm listening to my favorite like Christian music, Christian music, Christmas. Uh, <laughs> that's what I do. When I, that's my, this is the secret. This is free. This is a free tip. <laughs> Whenever I get ready for a divine appointment, I just put on Christmas music. Uh, last Christmas, I gave you my heart. That's the one. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so I put on this music, and, and I'm going out there. I'm getting all psyched up and praying. And then when I pull up, uh, I remember that he asked for uh, a chaplain. And then I'm like, oh, gosh, that's right. Like, it just dawns on me. Like, people are trained for this. <laughs> and then I'm like, uh, now it's, like, too late to Google that. And <laughs> so it's like, that's like your next thing. I just Google it real fast. What do chaplains do <laughs> when they go to hospice care? Top 10 things. Uh, so I'm like, it's too late. And so I'm just like, all right, we'll just kind of see how it goes. So I go in there, and we just kind of get into the conversation. It's hard because, you know, I've got this, like, heavy-duty mask on, and, and uh, he's laying there and, and, and going through the whole thing. But we just start talking, and he begins to kind of open up about some of his hang-ups uh, to, to the Christian faith and to belief and all this stuff. But he also starts opening up and talking about his wife and and just, you know, it's finally hitting him. And he's like, you know what? The reality is I'm, I'm probably never going to leave this room. And, and he's just like, wow, that hit me too. Like, you know, being in that kind of position. And he's like, I'm just so sad to, to leave my wife. You know, we've been married, I think it was for like 50 years or something like that, for 40 or 50 years. And, and just the thought of leaving her is, is crushing. Because she's, she's loved me through everything. And I haven't had any secrets or kept any secrets from her, and she knows everything about me, and she, she's loved me anyway. And she, he's just going on about this love that his wife has for him. And so, and then he, he kind of moved on to some of the other hang-ups and different things, and I'm kind of listening to that. And, and then finally, I just said, you know, and I just kind of called back to that. And I said, you know, I think you described it best when you're talking about your wife, is that the reality is, is that Jesus knows every single thing about you. You have no secrets from him. And yet he loves you anyway. And what you're so fearful of losing that kind of a relationship here on earth, you can gain in it for all of eternity. And so then just he really kind of thought about it. And I, and I kind of, you know, again, clueless as to what to do next. And so I just said, you know, can I, well, can I, and it wasn't like picking up whether he was like ready to like make the move or not. And so I was just like, well, can I pray for you before I leave? Is there anything I can pray for you about? And he said, yeah, sure. You know, he said, you know, you can pray for new life. And I said, well, that's going to require Jesus. You know, are you ready to accept Jesus? And he just started bawling into this towel. And he said, yes. And I said, well, I'm just going to give you a couple minutes and to just confess your sins to Jesus, to just lay it all out there, all the things, and just, just go to God with it. And so he did. And for several minutes, he just kind of just, just bawled and cried into this towel. And it was a really powerful moment. And then when he was finally done, he kind of came out and he said, okay, I'm ready. And so I just led him in a prayer. And then the thought came to me, you know, I should just pray for him to just receive the Holy Spirit's fullness. And again, at this point, like, I'm not like, and I thought I would like feel something. Like, I'd be like ready to go. Like, I'm all amped up. Like, I'm like, like man of God. <laughs> uh, but it was like, it wasn't happening. I, I, I felt nothing. And, uh, and, and, but I was just like, you know what, I'm going to do it anyway. So I went over to him, and, and I was like, I'm just going to put my hand on your chest if that's okay, and I'm just going to pray for you to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And so I just began to pray over him, that the Holy Spirit would come upon him and fill him, and, and just started praying over, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who always was and always is and always will be. And, and, he, go, and he just started going, I feel it, I feel it, I feel it, I feel it, I feel it. And I'm just praying for more, God, more, more, more. And he just kept, I feel it, I feel it, I feel it. And he's just weeping and bawling. And this is just crazy, crazy time. I've never seen anything like it, the way that he just received Christ and received the Holy Spirit. And it was insanely powerful. And, and, and it just went on. And then he had uh, the opportunity to finally like, call his wife. Who this, I mean, imagine, you know, a wife that's been praying for her husband for like 40 years for him to receive Christ, and he finally does. And I'm like, I just want to get out and let you have that moment with her on the phone. And so I did, and, and went out, and, uh, and they said that I went back and saw him a week later, 
And he was just like a totally changed person. Because going into that night, even at the beginning of our conversation, he was just blaming himself and blaming himself. I, I don't have nobody but to blame for my, but myself of what I've done from what I did to my body and, and what I did to you know, put my family through. It's just I got nobody but to blame by myself. And he didn't even want a funeral. He's like, I don't even want a memorial service. And I don't even want anybody to have to mess with that at all. And then when I came back a week later is his entire countenance had changed. He didn't blame himself a single time. He had total peace. Uh, up to that night, he had been having nightmares every single night. He didn't have a single nightmare from that night on. He had total peace, and then he asked me to officiate his, his funeral. And, you know, I had had one conversation with the guy, but he's like, I feel like you know me better than anybody else that, of the people that I know that could officiate that. And it was this crazy time, and he ended up passing away like three weeks later from that. But it was just growing in reading of the word, becoming the word, and growing in some holy boldness, and being willing to step out and, and just enter that 20 seconds of courage, and, and being able to just kind of kick back and say, okay, God, just speak to me, and just run with the thoughts that God gives us. Because that's, there are no gifted or ungifted. It's just those who hold themselves, who give themselves versus those who withhold themselves. And it's just about giving of ourselves. And then the third thing is the idea of be moved by compassion, not by obligation. Be moved by compassion, not by obligation. Is that when we look to the scriptures, so many times in the New Testament we hear and see that Jesus was moved by compassion for the group, for the blind men. He was moved by compassion. And there's a difference because when you're trying to move because of obligation or duty or because this is what, you know, the guy was talking about and now I feel like I got to do it. When you move by obligation, you're going to feel shame and condemnation when you don't. When you miss opportunities, when you fail to step out, if you're just trying to do it out of a sense of obligation, that's where the enemy wants to dump all this shame and condemnation on you. But when you're just moved by compassion, now you're free to just move out of love for people because I want people to taste and see what I've tasted and seen. I want people to have the cure, whether that's just because of through a prayer or buying some shoes or it's actually being able to present the gospel to somebody. It's all of those ways. It's just planting, watering, and God does the increase. And so planting, watering, and God does the increase. And obviously his wife had, had planted and planted and planted and planted and watered and watered and watered. And I just got the blessing of having to be the one there for, for the increase. And so this is a part of that experience. But it's being moved by compassion, not by obligation. Obligation, people will feel that. They will sense that. But they will also feel and sense when you're moved by compassion. And it's a different experience and a different exchange when you have that. In fact, just a, a couple of weeks ago, I was at Starbucks, and I was working, and I saw this guy. Uh, just kind of like, he was like hobbling in, and I think he had uh, maybe like one, one crutch, but he was kind of hobbling in, in a lot of pain, and barely walking up to the register, and he ordered a, a coffee, and, and then I saw him, and then the thought of like, I should pray for him, and I should pray for, pray for his healing. And, and then he, rather than sitting down, he walked out, and walked outside, and he actually had a bicycle out there. And so, um, so I was, and, and again, <laughs> it's, I, wish to, I wish I could say, like, it just comes easy. And you can just flip a switch, and all of a sudden, you're just like the bold, dynamic Christian all the time. But I was super hesitant. And, and so the thought came to me of, almost like this thought from God, of God saying, if you knew for sure that I would heal him if, I, if you prayed for him, then would, would you go? I was like, well, of course, if I knew for sure you would heal him, like, of course I would go. <laughs> and, and then God just said, then go. And so I got up, and I went outside, and I was just like, hey, man. And again, it's just, this is, it's just being casual with people. It's not, here comes the man of God, like, just like kicking doors open. <laughs> like, look out. Give me that crutch. Like, you just, not going to need that no more. Oh, man. <laughs> just like. Not being weird about it, but it's just like, hey, man, like, what, what's going on? And, you know, I just noticed your, your knee, and he's like, oh, yeah, man. He's like, I had a, a biking accident, motorcycle accident, like, you know, years and years and years ago, and it busted up my knee, 
And now, like, you know, there's no more cartilage left uh, in, in my, my knee, and it's just, like, bone on bone, and it's just really painful and really hard to walk. And so I just kind of introduced myself. I said, hey, you know, I'm Ryan. He's Kevin. And, and we started kind of talking, and so I was like, hey, man, you know, is it okay if I just pray for your knee? And he's like, sure, yeah, that's fine. And so I just kind of, like, is it okay if I put my hand on your knee? And he's like, yeah, that's fine. So I put my hand on his knee and just said, you know, Lord, I just thank you for Kevin. I thank you for his life. And I thank, that it, thank you for everything you want to do through him. And so, Lord, I just pray for healing right now. Pain, get out in the mighty name of Jesus. And I said, amen. And, and I was like, okay. Well, and I, prior to that, I had asked him, like, what level of pain? And he had said it was level eight. And, and so he said it was level eight pain. And then I prayed. And I said, okay, now, you know, kind of test it out and see. And so he kind of moved his knee a little bit. And he goes, and he's like, What? He's like, that's so bizarre. He's like, that's so weird. And I was like, what? He's like, well, the, the pain's gone. He goes, are you a healer? I was like, no, man, I'm a Christian. <laughs> and he was just like, he's like, man, it's so crazy. That's so bizarre. And, and then I just told him, and he said, you know, he, we had, we, and then it kind of launched into this great conversation where he said, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of open spiritually, but I really don't have anything solid, and, and, uh, and I've just been kind of open. And I said, well, you know, I think when you, as long as you stay open, and, and he also just expressed how he was just kind of confused and unrest and a lot of torment and stuff going on. And I said, well, you know, that's how you're going to feel when you're just open. It, the scripture says that it's like being on waves and out in the ocean just tossed around by everything. But it, when you actually come and settle on Christ, it's like building your house on the rock and on the foundation, and that's where your strength and your comfort comes from. And... And so we just kind of talked a little bit. I said, and he said, well, you know, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how long this healing lasts. I was like, okay. I was like, well, you know, if it, if it does come back, just pray like I did, in Jesus' name. And he's like, okay. And so we, then we just left and, and kind of left it at that, and I prayed for him and, and kind of parted ways. And that was that experience. Again, it's just taste and see that the Lord is good. Why does God want us to pray for people? Be, so that they can taste and see. A lot of times it's just to pray for that person to experience peace and warmth, or love, and you'd be amazed how many times that will happen, but it's tasting and seeing that the Lord is good, so that then they have an experience to go out to, and something uh, to beyond just an explanation of God, they get an experience with God, and so that's a, a powerful, ask, move, be moved by compassion, not by obligation, and then we've got participation leads to passion, so one of the things is that God wants you to know is that he wants you to participate. Is that even in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it's 5 through 9, and it's uh, Paul writing about himself and Apollos. And there's this, you know, who's following who, Paul or Apollos? And, and, he said, and Paul just says, you know, some plant, some water, and God does the increase. Paul, myself, and, and Apollos, we're just co-workers with God. We're co-laborers with God. It's we're, we just get the opportunity to participate with God, and God wants us to participate because participation leads to passion. When you actually start stepping out and experiencing these things, and some of you already have, and you've already experienced it for yourself, you know that so much more passion gets built up because there's a mutual encouragement that happens through that. And it makes the faith really come, and come alive, and it becomes an adventure, and all of a sudden Christianity becomes fun. Like, how many people have ever described Christianity as fun? Like, nobody. If you ever if you did, like, one of those, like, family feud things where it's, like, top ten things when people think about Christianity. Fun! It's fun up there! <laughs> Bleh, like, no! And it's like, why would you even suggest that? That's like the little clip where they make fun of the person because of their answer. Can you believe they said fun for Christianity? And it's like, what an idiot! But like this is where Christianity becomes fun because you do get to encounter people. And this reminds, like I grew up playing soccer. Uh, both my wife and I played soccer in a college. And, and I love playing soccer. Even today, uh, you know, today playing, being able to play soccer and coach my son's uh, soccer team. And, and I love playing soccer. But I cannot stand to watch soccer. Like watching soccer to me is just boring. But like playing soccer is amazing. And that's the same way with, with church, I think, a lot. When you just come and you just observe and you just kind of watch 
Like, yeah, there's a few exciting moments, just like there is with soccer, but overall, it can become boring, and it can become dull, but it's when you actually get to participate, and you actually get to engage in the faith, that's when it becomes so much fun, and it becomes this adventure, because it totally transforms into this whole new thing, where it's just, when you think about any, any high schoolers that play sports in here, any, They're all oh, okay, perfect, yeah, um, <laughs> Just send, send, send it out there. Uh, I was like, wow, like not a single sports player in the room. <laughs> Note to self, move away from athletic references. Uh, but it's this idea like on a game day, who, who's the most excited? Like when I played basketball in high school, my junior year, I like rode the bench uh, for, for, the, for the varsity team. I would play JV and then sit on the bench. And me and my friends, like we knew we weren't going in the game. Like we would have people bring us slushies and, and popcorn. <laughs> Uh, we're like so far down the bench they couldn't even see us. Um, but like on, on those game days, who do you think was more excited? The, the starters or the bench warmers? Like the starters, because they know they're getting in the game. They know they play a role. They know they're going to get to participate. They're going to be a part of the action. The bench warmers, is like, it's just like almost like another day. It's like almost it's less exciting than practice. In a lot of ways. So it's the same way with the faith of seeing the faith as participative and engaged. And God wants you to be a part of it. And God will use anybody. He doesn't play favorites. Scripture says he has no favorites. It's not about gifted or ungifted. It's about those that will give themselves. And then the last point is those who sow sparingly reap sparingly. And this was used in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 by Paul to describe tithing and giving to, um, giving to the cause so that they could then uh, pass those monies uh, along to be able to provide for other people. But I think it fits perfectly here with divine opportunities too, is that those that sow sparingly reap sparingly. Those that sow generously reap generously. And that Jesus and God loves a person who gives cheerfully. He loves a cheerful giver. Not just financially, but of yourself, of your time, of your conversation, of your social awkwardness, to overcome those things. That God loves a cheerful giver that sees somebody and is prompted, I should pray for them, and cheerfully gives over to that moment and gives themselves. And again, if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. So if you're only reaching out, you know, once a month, once every few months, you, you're willing to take a risk, then you will reap, but you'll reap sparingly. Versus the person that's just like spreading seed like crazy, and every week, multiple times a week, they're sowing generously, no matter where they are, whether they're at work, or they're at home, or they're at school, or at Starbucks, or wherever, the gym, but they're just there, but also with an eye to, to see the unseen, to hear the unheard. And willing to say, hey, you know, I noticed, you know, you got, you look like you got a problem with your, with your ankle. Is it okay if I pray for you? Hey, uh, you know, when you mentioned you, you got a big test tomorrow and you're kind of stressed about it. Is it okay if I pray for you? I know you got that big job interview coming up. You know, would it be okay if I prayed for you? And then you just start sowing generously. And then that's when you start to reap generously. Of course, the more seed that you throw, the more likely you are to have a harvest in that. And so even... Um, you know, even a couple, a couple weeks ago, it's been a few, few weeks ago, uh, I was at uh, our friend's nonprofit. They had a 5K uh, called the, the Healed Ones for their son that had, had uh, been through like stage four bone cancer. And so we had this 5K and, and I was there to kind of pray for people. And so there was this lady at the end of the time after the 5K and she was walking around kind of barefooted and she was just like hobbling you know, on, this, on the, her right foot. And she had tape around it, but she was just in obvious pain, and she was about to leave. And so I just kind of went up to her and introduced myself and said, hey, you know, I just noticed, you know, you look like you got something going on with your, with your ankle. Like, is it okay if I pray for you before you, before you leave? And she's like, yeah, sure, that's fine. I said, you know, well, where's the pain? She said, the outside of the ankle. I said, you know, what, what level of pain are you experiencing? She, she said, eight. And I was like, okay, well, I'll pray for you. So I bent down, <coughs> again, kind of like what I did with the other guy. I just prayed for it. And I was like, okay, test it out. And she goes, and she, she immediately like turns. She's like, I'll test it on the way to the car. And she's just like, I mean, she was out. She was like done. Like she clearly was just like, I think she was more letting me pray because she was like, oh my gosh, that's adorable. Sure. Like, like you're so cute. Go ahead and pray. Uh, and then she's like, I gotta go. And so she was just like out of there. Like she did not expect to get healed whatsoever. Had zero faith that that prayer was gonna do a single bit of thing. She was just ready to move on to the car. So she just hobbles off. 
and wouldn't test it out at all. Uh, and I was like, oh man, like what a bummer. Because I had just had a couple of these other experiences. So I was, I was all excited. And I was like, man, what a bummer. So I kind of went and started, um, and, and started putting some waters into the, into the cooler and stuff and doing some other things. I was kind of bent over. And then like five minutes later, I hear this lady uh, say, hey. And, and I look up and it's the lady that I prayed for her ankle. And she had sunglasses on. And she pointed under her sunglasses, and she goes, these are tears. And I was like, what, what happened? She goes, the, the, the pain went away. And she's like, as we were walking to the car, all the pain just went away. And so she had made the trip back, which I was so grateful for. She had walked all the way back just to tell me. And I was like, praise God. And again, there was just this amazing moment of just overcoming the social awkwardness and the question of, well, what if nothing happens? And so we're going to get into all that and more kind of tonight of like, you know, how do you approach some of those situations? How do you get over the question of what if nothing happens? Uh, and quite honestly, when I started uh, and, and the first person got healed, it was at like a West Covina mall. Like I was more surprised than they were. They're like, the pain's gone. I'm like, stop it. Like what? Don't you lie to me. Like it's still there. Yeah. It's like, like I was just as surprised as they were. And so, it, it, but it's also this question of like, what if nothing happens? And so we're going to address so much more uh, tonight and I encourage you to, to come back for that because this is a, a story that I want to tell in terms of like, the, the second book is called Untapped Potential, Moving from a Mediocre to a Miraculous Testimony. And, and some people have kind of given me grief about the, the title. They're like, how could you dare call somebody's testimony like mediocre? And I'm like, it, for me personally, like 100%, mine was totally mediocre for a couple of decades just being lukewarm, like nothing to write home about in terms of God's activity in my life. And a testimony is just God's activity in your life. And, and, and I had, you know, was just lukewarm, had nothing to write home about, and, and just was living life for me. It was about my kingdom, my will, not God's kingdom or his will, and, and moving from there. And then as God got a hold of me and I started pressing in, like now I've seen this, this move and I'm going for more and hungry for more. And when you do start to participate, that's what happens. You get hungry for more. Not because it's a notch on your belt or it's about a resume building testimony. It's about people being able to taste and see that the Lord is good and know what you've already received and being able to share the cure and share the recipe and see God move for people, not so that I can have great stories to share. In fact, you know, and, and that's the thing about all these things, all these stories, like these were just thoughts and promptings where nobody knew but, but me and God. Like if I didn't step out in any of these moments, none of you would think, you would, none of you would know any different or, or think any less of me because you wouldn't even have a clue that I had those opportunities and that I had missed. And I still miss them. I mean, even just the other day at the kid's soccer game, there was a guy uh, recovering, I think, from a knee surgery and, and for whatever reason, you know, again, hesitant to, to go. So it's not like I'm batting a thousand or anywhere close to it. It's probably like, like that in baseball, where it's like if you're batting like 300, like three out of 10, <laughs> like you, you actually get a hit, like you're an all-star. And that's probably the, the realistic nature of this. And, and I'll try um, one, one last thing, and I'll wrap up in prayer, but um, is there, um, so is there, is there anybody here with the name Kate? It goes by Kate. Or Katie, someone with uh, Catherine with the full name. No, okay, maybe tonight. And then how about a, uh, a Steve or Karen? We got Karen and Steve makes Steve, but not a Steve and Karen. Okay, all right, we'll we'll save that tonight. And so again, this is part of it. Is like okay, that was a little bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm over it. Uh, but that's also part of it is like a month ago in August, I went to a church and I was doing a, a, a post-college group and, and a similar thing. I just prayed for the, for the church before I was going and, and God gave me the name Sarah and, and a message for her uh, about this whole image of like she was representative of the wind and the wind was blowing around over the ocean and it really had no, no place to, to land or no place to be harnessed, but it had all this great excitement and passion and enthusiasm, and it was just blowing around, but it was feeling underutilized and, and, and just kind of lost. 
And then came along a sailboat with this sail, and which was this nonprofit or for-profit business that they had the product, they had the services, but they just didn't have the wind. And they needed the wind and she needed the sail. And that eventually God was opening doors so that when she met up with this company that she would feel harnessed and utilized and that they had the product and the service that when her wind came, her energy and enthusiasm and zest, then the, the nonprofit would take off and move. And so similar thing, I kind of write it down and, and I was doing a Friday night and a Saturday morning. So Friday night I go and I'm like listening for Sarah, not a single Sarah in the bunch, just like this. And uh, the next morning, still listening at breakfast and then spoke, not a single Sarah in the bunch. I'm like, wow. And then after my second session, a girl came up to me and her name was uh, Kara. And at this point, like this word is just like burning a hole in my pocket. And, and I'll be honest, I was tempted. Kara, Sarah, close enough. <laughs> like, let's do this. Um, but also, I had had kind of like a word about the, the dad's name and to ask about the dad's name. And so I asked about the dad's name, and she's like, yeah, my, name, my dad's name is Bernie Weber. And I was like, yep, that's not it. Uh, hard no on Bernie Weber. Um, so, but then I was like, oh, but then we went upstairs, and the pastor was doing a session, and, and I was like, but that name does sound familiar. And so I looked it up, and, and sure enough, I had had like a whole email. I actually knew Bernie Weber. And in that conversation, she had talked about how her dad had passed away uh, over the quarantine. And so she had just opened up and shared about her dad and his, and his passing. And then I realized, like, oh, my gosh, I totally knew that guy because I had done their men's retreat like three years earlier. And while I was at their men's retreat, Bernie Weber, I had become really fond of and really, really close with. In fact, he looked just like this gentleman here with the white, white beard. And... And so we had exchanged, you know, we had had a couple conversations afterwards, emails, and so I looked him up, and I had all these emails from Bernie Weber, and I was like, oh my gosh, like, that's why, you know, I was supposed to ask about the dad. And then I ended up having a divine appointment with her at lunch. And then, still no Sarah, so I'm talking with the pastor, he did his breakout session, sent the, the women over here, men over there, they're doing their thing, and we're just kind of talking, hanging out, and then this girl walks in super late, she missed both Friday night, she missed Saturday morning, the whole thing, she walks in crazy late, and the pastor goes, oh my gosh, I'm glad you, you finally were able to make it, Sarah. And I'm like, stop it! Like, and so I shared this whole thing with her. And I was like, does that make any sense to you? And she's like, yeah, 100%. She's like, I'm so glad you shared that with me. She's like, I can't even put into words how much that means to me. And we just had this incredible moment and prayed over her. And so that's again where it's like, was this a little bit awkward? Sure. But also you just never know what God's up to. And so this evening, I encourage you, come back, bring some friends, because I'm going to share more stories where, again, I thought one thing was happening, God did something totally, totally different and unexpected, and also times where I failed and times where I've succeeded, but to encourage you, build you up, show you kind of practically, again, how I pray for people, and give you some, some models that I've been able to glean from other models of mine, and, and really be able to build you up to send you out. And, and I want to leave you with this. So this is your task for this afternoon, is that when you go to lunch, if you go to lunch somewhere to, to eat after this, this is what I want you to do, is that when you go to lunch, you know, you'll, you're, you know if you've got a waiter or waitress, and you order all your food, and kind of do your thing, you know, they'll, uh, they'll come, and they'll bring your food. Eventually, you know, they, that's, why am I describing how lunch works? Um, <laughs> they bring your food. I mean, that'd be a terrible restaurant if they didn't. Um, but they come back, and usually they drop off all the food, and they say, you know, is there anything else I can get you? Or anything else we can do for you? And so what I want you to say is, well, actually, you know, we were just about to pray before we eat. Is there anything we can pray for you about? So 20 seconds of courage. Hey, we were, and so, you know, go and maybe let people know, because sometimes people want to pray over the appetizer, and I'm like, Ugh. now I got to be awkward, and we got to pray again. Uh, over the meal, because the appetizer doesn't really have the same kind of moment uh, there. So if you can hold out your prayer, God will forgive you. If you wait till the meal, you can eat your apps. But just simply say, hey, is there anything else we can get you? Yeah, actually, you know, we were just about to pray before we eat. Is there anything we can pray for you about? And then give them a second, because sometimes people go, you know, quicker into it. Others really want to test and see if you're legit or not. And, and just kind of leave, let it hang. And, and then I promise you, you know, nine times out of ten or more than that, people will say something. You know, health, school, 
finance, whatever it is. And if you feel open to it, say, you know, if they give you something general like that, is there anything more specific about that we can pray for you about? And if they do, don't, you know, kind of leave it open, be flexible. But just simply, we're about to pray before we eat. Is there anything we can pray for you about? And let it hang. And then it's just easy enough to say, you know what, would it be okay if we just prayed for you right now real quick? It'll take 10, 20 seconds. It doesn't have to be a long, long prayer. 10 seconds. Then just pray over them real quick. Lord, we thank you for, you know, whoever it is. We thank you for what you're doing in their life. We pray over this in their life. God, we just thank you that we've had this moment with them. We pray and we bless them in Jesus' mighty name. Boom. Thank you, and then let it go. And then, if you have the means, tip them 50%. So don't just bless them, you know, with a prayer, but bless them financially too. <clears throat> and let them know, Jesus loves you. You can write a little note on the, on the receipt. Jesus loves you. And bless them with a, with a nice, healthy tip. And again, it's just sowing seed everywhere you go. Sowing seed, sowing seed, sowing seed, and see what God does. Because you'd be amazed how many times people will tell you, you know what, this is the highlight of my day. You know what, this is the highlight of my shift. You know what, I really needed this. I've been doing it at Chick-fil-A and in and out in the drive through and I've had people say, you know what, this is, the first sh- this is actually my first shift back since my grandmother passed away. Had another guy say, you know what, actually just yesterday I found out that my, one of my good friends, my buddies, uh, died in a car accident on his way back from Vegas. Uh, another girl, you know what, I just had to break up with my boyfriend because I found out that he was cheating on me. And so there's all these sorts of moments. And sometimes, again, it's, it's just, you know, prayer, you know, health, general stuff. But you never know when somebody wants to open up and share and you have that opportunity. So, Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you, God. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for your Holy Spirit movement. We love you so much. And we just want other people to taste and see that the Lord is good We just want other people to be able to receive the recipe for inner peace. We want them to receive the cure for cancer of the soul. We want people to be able to receive Jesus, to receive his love, to receive his compassion, to receive your spirit, to know that there are brothers and sisters in Christ, sons and daughters of a living God that are willing to get outside themselves, see beyond themselves, and to be able to touch the world around them, to be able to open people up so that they can get a taste and a desire and a longing for so much more. Lord, I just pray that that everyone here feels encouraged to be able to come back this evening to cancel plans if they need to and if they can, to invite friends or invite neighbors that need to taste and see that the Lord is good, that this evening can be a powerful time of, again, teaching and testimony and even being able to hear from some of these lunch story experiences and to be able to receive some some practical guidance, to be able to ask questions, to be able to receive prayers of healing, that we can just prepare our hearts for this evening, for this afternoon, for this entire day and this entire week ahead, Lord. That, they, that this church would be open to sharing testimonies every week. A testimony, who stepped out. Even if you failed, we want to hear about the stories of failure just as we want to hear about the stories of successes because we can learn from both. So don't ever be afraid to share testimonies of failures, to be able to share and be honest about times where we've stepped out and fallen short, but Lord, that this would be a church that could encourage one another and keep each other accountable for stepping out, to moving in faith, to sharing the testimonies of failures and successes, to seeing you move and learning from everything, to be able to experience you and to share your glory with the city of Ventura. Lord, we praise you and we thank you, and it's in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. I hope you're feeling fired up, so let's stand as we finish with one song in worship this morning. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause the shame's done all it's stealing. Are you desperate for some healing? Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way when there ain't no way, rises up from an empty grave, ain't no sinner that he can't save, let me tell you about my Jesus, his love's strong and his grace is free, and the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me.
Make sure you bring uh, Karen and Steve if you know them. All right, see you tonight at 6 p.m. And Kate.